joy to begin our time of worship this morning with Believer's Baptism. And standing with me in the waters is Mary Schull. And Mary grew up in this church. Her uh, grandparents are active members here in this congregation. And um, she's got an older sister. And she's got lots of people in this congregation who know her and love her. And I want to invite those that have been a part of her faith journey to stand to show their support and so this will include family members and Sunday school teachers and people who've known Mary in Vacation Bible School and in our children's programs and just been good friends with her in the hallway over the years. And Mary writes this letter to God. She says, I'm excited about being baptized because Jesus is my Savior and I love him with all my heart. I'm glad to be a Christian. Sincerely, Mary Scholl. Mary, before all of these who are here today for worship, those that are standing to show their support, as well as all of our other friends who are here, what is the profession of your faith? Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And Mary, based on that profession of your faith, I baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. standing with me is Maddie Vaughn. And Maddie also has family here in this church. Her parents are very, very active members, and uh, she's got an older brother who's already gone before her in baptism as well. Maddie's about to be uh, a fourth grader, and she writes this letter to God. I'm excited to be baptized today because I get to show people that I want to follow Jesus. Maddie. Maddie, I ask you, uh, first of all, let me invite family members and others that have been a part of your journey to stand to show their support for you uh, at this time. And also would like to say a word 
in the fellowship on Broadway, we have several other folks that are worshiping with us at this hour. And uh, Maddie, I'm sure they're standing for you to show their support over there as well. And before all of these who are standing and these who are seated, Maddie, I want to ask you, what is the profession of your faith? Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And Maddie, based on that profession of your faith, I baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And there is water here. If you have trusted Christ as Savior but have not followed him in baptism, then let nothing hinder you this day from uh, coming home to Christ. Let me pray for these that have been baptized, and we will continue this time of worship. Our Father, we are so grateful and so thankful for your love. And thank you that Mary and Maddie at a young age have come to a point of understanding that Jesus loves them that he gave his life for them. God, help them and help us in every step that we take on this journey called faith to bring honor to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> To sing another stanza? Sure you do. Sing them all. <laughs> we'll take the third one. Ready and go. I will praise the You may be seated, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for leading our music this morning as Joe finishes up, I think, some vacation time. We also have a guest uh, preacher this morning. Hope Frank says a little bit more about Dr. Org. They're, they've been friends for a while, and Frank's a graduate of Golden Gate Seminary, but we're glad to have Dr. Org with us today. number of guests with us today. Many of you are attending the missions conference, the SEND mission conference across the street. 
at both Bridgestone and Music City Center. Huge conference that will be going on uh, Monday and Tuesday, sponsored by North American Mission Board. Some of us will be volunteering uh, over there. Probably still some room if you'd like to do that. We do have a few tickets left. If you'd like to just attend the conference, see me out in the lobby. I'll be by the far door, exit door, and we'll see if we can connect you. But welcome uh, if you're visiting here today for that conference or some of you just in town on vacation. We always have folks who uh, find First Baptist Church as part of their weekend in Nashville, and we're glad that you're here. We have a card if you'd like to uh, take that on the right side of your bulletin, tear that out. If you'd like to leave a record of your attendance, and uh, you can do that, whatever, whatever information that you would like to share uh, this morning with us. Also, members, if you need to update some information, Many of you toward the end of the summer are moving different places or changing numbers, uh, hopefully not to keep us from calling you, but let us know your new number, and uh, we'd like to have that in our records. If you can stick around this weekend, those of you who are visiting, tremendous experience Friday and Saturday is we're going to play host Friday morning to, uh, last word, 25 Congressional Medal of Honor winners uh, here in our place, and so you'll see a note about that. Be sure and read all the announcements, but you might take note of that one. It's going to be a special weekend, special day, special week here in Nashville and at First Baptist Church. Thank you for being here. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Come before his presence, come before his presence with singing. Before his presence was singing, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all 
Sansa says, proclaim to every people, tongue, and nation that God in whom they live and move is love. Tell him how they stooped to save his lost creation and even died on earth that we might live above. That is good news worth telling. And it's good news worth hearing. And it's how a church like ours and like Christ's church in the world makes its best impact. Publish my tidings, tidings of peace, tidings of Jesus, redemption and release. Give all thy own to make a message glorious. Give all thy love to speak and love and take just a moment and give a special word of appreciation and thanks to my friend Jeff Orge, who is the president of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, it is a great seminary. It is one of the seminaries that we have in our convention, and your gifts uh, help support that uh, seminary and their ministry. And uh, just i am so grateful for the opportunity to have uh, Dr. Orge with us today. Uh, because of the SIN North America Conference, I wanted to invite one of our uh, Southern Baptist friends that you don't always get a chance to hear from and so uh, when I knew that he was coming to town I extended the invitation and uh, just really appreciate it. you're gonna be blessed uh, Dr. Orge is a phenomenal leader he's a gifted speaker he's doing great things in the life of uh, our seminary that is currently located in the Mill Valley area San Francisco on the West Coast uh, but is relocating to Southern California where they might better serve the kingdom. And uh, you're going to be blessed today to hear him. I hope you'll have a chance uh, to meet him and interact and talk a little bit after our service this morning. Let me lead us in our time of prayer for our uh, offering. And uh, let me also call your attention to several in our church family that have prayer needs that we want to remember today. Uh, Diane Packard, uh, we pray for her in the death of her mother. Uh, we also want to remember Heather Clark, Tim Gentry, uh, John Fletcher, and uh, Tim Gentry as they uh, continue uh, some tests on Tim, particularly in the hospital this week. Lori Haywood is also at the hospital this morning. We want to remember Lori. We are celebrating with the Clark family. I mentioned Heather. Um, little Easton James Clark was born this week, so they welcome uh, the birth of a, another son into their family, and we rejoice with them. We remember today our service men, our service women. We remember situations around our world where the hand of God needs to be uh, felt by people who are hurting and by people who are going through things that are just so hard for us to imagine today. We are thankful for uh, the safe return of our uh, missionary teams to uh, Haiti, uh, to Montana, to Canada, and uh, celebrate uh, what they were able to do in the last uh, several days as they ministered uh, to people in other parts of the world. Let's pray together. Father, for each of these whom we have named and many others beside who are on our heart today, we pause to uh, ask that your hand of mercy and your hand of healing and strength and encouragement would be felt. That God, they would know your presence in a powerful and strong way today. 
We ask that as we have the joy and the privilege of bringing our offerings, knowing that they support not only the work of missionaries in faraway places, but they also uh, help in the training of ministers. Uh, we pray today that you'll help us to be generous uh, and to give joyfully, uh, Father, knowing that we also have the privilege of being able to serve Christ uh, here on this corner with your people. Uh, God, we're so thankful for the work that you are doing through the life of this congregation. We pray that today, as a result of having been in this place, to hear your word preached and to sing songs of praise that affirm our faith, that, God, you'll be honored and that you'll draw our hearts closer to you. All these things and more we ask in Christ's name. Amen.
Take away the songs I sing. Take away all the lights and all the songs you let me write. Does the gal I am today say the words you need to say? Let them see you in me. Let them hear you when I speak. Let them feel you when I sing. Let them see you. Let them see you and me. Who Another smile, another face, another breath, a grain of sand, passing quickly through your hand. I give my life an offering. Take it all, take everything. Let them see you in me. Let them hear you when I speak. Let them feel you when I sing. Let them see you. Let them see you in me. With I sing a simple melody and I pray they'll hear more than a song in me, in me. Let them see you in me, let them hear you. Speak, let them feel you when I sing, let them see you. Just let them hear you in me. Good morning. Open your Bibles with me to the book of Acts, chapter 11, where in just a moment I'll be reading a passage of Scripture that will be foundational for the morning's message from Acts, chapter 11. While you're turning there, let me say thank you to Pastor Frank for the high privilege of being invited to preach here at First Baptist Nashville. Uh, and thank you also for your longtime support of Golden Gate Seminary as you have given through the cooperative program of the Southern Baptist Convention. Some of those resources have come to the West Coast and helped build a significant seminary in a place where Baptists are sparse and without the kind of national support that we've enjoyed, we would not have been able to succeed and build a seminary like the one we enjoy there in the West. You may not know much about Golden Gate, and I'm not here to give you a long commercial about it this morning. If you'd like to know more about Golden Gate Seminary, come up after the service. I'd be delighted to talk with you about what God is doing through our school in the West. As a young idealistic minister, I wanted to pastor a significant church. 
Now, by significant, I did not necessarily mean large. I meant a church that made an impact in its community and the world. And I remember saying, especially during my college days, this phrase, someday I'm going to pastor a New Testament church. Meaning by that, that I would experience all of the power that I discovered in the New Testament church described in the early part of the book of Acts. But then I actually started studying the Bible. And I discovered the New Testament churches. Corinth divided over public immorality. The Thessalonians so confused about the Lord's second coming they had sold their businesses, dressed in white, and were sitting on hillsides. The Philippians with so much internal dissension that two women are named by name in the Bible for all time as being two folk who needed to stop their conflict and improve their fellowship. When I get to heaven, I want to ask those women, was it really worth it? <laughs> I discovered I was not quite confident I wanted to pastor a New Testament church. <laughs> but then one day, in further Bible reading, I discovered Acts chapter 11 and the introduction to the church at Antioch a church that has come to mean much to me over the years and which is the model church in the New Testament for a church that truly did impact not only its world, but the world all the way down till today seated before me here at First Baptist Church. For it was at the church at Antioch that the gospel was first preached in the Gentile community, meaning it broke out of its Jewish strictures and started to be a gospel finally for everyone. And that's why I say the impact extends even to today because apart from the breakthrough we'll read about in this city, Antioch, and in this particular church, there would have never been a church like yours gathered these centuries later. So the church at Antioch, a model church for us of a church that truly makes an impact. Verse 19. Those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the message to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, Cypriot and Cyrenian men, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Hellenists, or the Greeks, or the Gentiles, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Then the report about them was heard by the church that was at Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with a firm resolve of the heart, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and large numbers of people were added to the Lord. Then he went to Tarsus to search for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught large numbers. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. In those days some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine throughout the Roman world. This took place during the time of Claudius. So each of the disciples, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brothers who lived in Judea. They did this, sending it to the elders by means of Barnabas and Saul. Now turn the page to chapter 13, verse 1. In the church that was at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius, a Cyrenian, Menaean, a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work I have called them to. Then after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off. As I said, this church in Antioch provides for us a model, really, of what it takes today for a church to make an impact in our world. So I simply point out some highlights from this text to you this morning. First, a church that makes an impact shares the gospel. Now that may seem so simple and yet so, and so basic and yet so easily confused or ignored in church life today. A church that makes an impact shares the gospel. Look back through the text with me for evidence of this. 
First, this church started by a gospel-sharing movement when in verse 20, these men from Cyprus and Cyrene came and began preaching the gospel for the first time, not just in the Jewish community, but now in the Gentile community as well. And notice the result in verse 21. The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number turned to the Lord. Then Barnabas arrived from Jerusalem. Some months had passed when this occurred. Barnabas becomes the pastoral leader of the church. Notice the results of his ministry described at the end of verse 24. And large numbers of people were added to the Lord. So we see that this church began with a gospel-sharing movement of preachers coming into the community and communicating the gospel for everyone. And then we see the church continuing its gospel-sharing ministry with Barnabas arriving, assuming a pastoral responsibility and leading the church to continue doing this work of sharing the gospel. And as a result, large numbers of people were coming to the Lord. But it extends even beyond that. Because as I asked you to read over in chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, we see the church gathering for worship and the Holy Spirit prompting Barnabas and Saul to be set apart for what the Bible describes as the work I have called them to. Now we know from studying the rest of the book of Acts that the work that they were set aside for on that day in Antioch was the work of taking the gospel to other cities around the Mediterranean world. If you've studied the book of Acts, you know these are commonly called mission trips or Paul's journeys. And there are several of them through the book of Acts as Paul made trips around the Mediterranean world, planting church after church after church in both Gentile and Jewish communities, trying to get the gospel to as many people as possible. Now, the Antioch church then started as a gospel-sharing movement, continued under a gospel-sharing pastor, and then was ascending gospel-sharing church that got the gospel to its then-known world. There's a, almost a throwaway line in this text. It seems almost like an add-on that really reveals how this church was so effective at gospel-sharing. Notice, if you would, the last part of verse 26. The Bible says, The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Now, that little tag on, or what may seem, there are no throwaway lines in Scripture, I know that, but what seems almost like a tag on or a throwaway line or just an addendum stuck on the end of that verse is really quite significant. Many people believe that this is actually a, a, a derogatory word that was ascribed to the church at Antioch. In other words, they were not called the Christians at Antioch, they were called the Christians at Antioch. Why so? Why were the people formerly called the believers or followers of the way or the disciples, why were they now called the Christians or the Christ ones? Because most believe the people in Antioch had developed such a reputation for talking about the Christ, the Christ, the Christ, the Christ, the Christ, the Christ, the Christ. The Christ. Everywhere they went, it was about the Christ, whether it was the marketplace, the workplace, the recreation place. Everywhere they went, they talked about the Christ, the Christ, the Christ. And because of that, the community saw them coming and said, well, here they come, here come the Christians. Now I ask you quite seriously this morning, First Baptist Church, when you come back here seven days from now, what will your community say that you've been talking about all week long? It's so easy to talk about the things that are most important to us, most dear to us, or most frequently in our minds. For example, if you bring up my children, I'll talk for a long time about all three of them. And if you want to talk grandchild, I've got all day. In fact, I have pictures. In fact, God allowed the iPhone to be invented so grandparents could carry around entire albums of photographs of their children and grandchildren. It doesn't take much to get me talking about Oregon Ducks football. I know I'm down in SEC country, but I'm sorry, there are other teams. And because I'm from the Bay Area and an avid baseball fan, the San Francisco Giants are an easy conversation for me as well. My children, my grandchildren, the San Francisco Giants, the Oregon Ducks, and of course my work 
ask me about the seminary, as poor Pastor Frank did earlier this morning, and you get a 30-minute speech about the wonders of being at Golden Gate Seminary and all that means. It's easy to talk about our families, our hobbies, our interests, our occupations. What's wrong with us? That it's so difficult, so unnatural, so strange to talk about the Christ. To simply introduce Jesus Christ into the normal conversations of life as a person who is at the center of all we are, all we believe, and all that's important to us. We've overcomplicated this issue of witnessing our evangelism, our gospel sharing, as I'm describing it this morning. I'm trying to simplify it this morning and say, at its essence, it's simply talking about the Christ, the Christ, the Christ. It's introducing Jesus Christ into the conversation in such a way that you communicate to others what he means to you and what he can mean to them. It's not offensive, except in its message it sometimes is, but in its presentation it's not offensive, it's not mean-spirited, it's not bombastic, it's as natural as talking about anything else that matters to us, it's talking about the Christ. I challenge you this morning to be a church that makes an impact this week by talking about Jesus Christ in the same way that you talk about these so many other things that are so important to you. Second, a church that makes an impact experiences the Holy Spirit. Now there are many implied references to the Spirit in this text. No doubt, for example, those first preachers who came and started the church would say they were Spirit-empowered or Spirit-led. But let's not consider the implied references. Let's just look at the three that are explicit in the text. First, Barnabas is described as being a man, a good man, full of the Holy Spirit in verse 24, end of faith. And then in verse 28, Agabus, this guest preacher from Jerusalem, is described as standing up and predicting or preaching or speaking forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then again over in chapter 13 at verse 2, as they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, I believe that means in the context of a public worship service like the one we're experiencing this morning, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. This church experienced the Holy Spirit in at least three distinct ways. The Holy Spirit was evident in filling the pastoral leader Barnabas. He was evident in speaking through the guest preacher Agabus. And he was evident in working among the people of the worship service so that they might rise up and do that which God was, was commanding or motivating them to do. It's experiencing the Holy Spirit is sometimes confusing in our world because frankly many people who talk about doing this in church context go to only one small passage of scripture Acts chapter 2 and try to build an entire understanding of what the Spirit is doing in the church from that one passage but really Acts chapter 11 is a much better model why so Acts chapter 2 is an introductory experience it's when the Holy Spirit first introduced himself to the church, came into and upon the church in powerful ways. And that was accompanied by what we, would might, what we might describe as supernatural, but what I would prefer to describe as super visible ways of operating. We see that and we wonder, is that how the Holy Spirit always works in the church? But now let's advance eight to ten years into the life of the early church. That's Acts chapter 11. Now, I know it may not seem that that long has passed from Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 11. You can sit down and read those passages in about 30 minutes or so. But the first part of the book of Acts covers almost a decade in the history of the church. And so by the time we arrive in Acts chapter 11, the church is maturing in its attitude and its actions and its worship styles and its practices. And the Holy Spirit is intersecting the church now, not as it did in the introductory moment, but in the continuing work that it's assigned to do. How do we see the Holy Spirit showing himself in this passage? Well, first, by filling the pastoral leader Barnabas. And what did the pastoral leader Barnabas do after being filled with the Spirit? A very remarkable thing. He chose an associate. Notice verse 25. Then he went to Tarsus 
to search for Saul. Now, this may not seem that dramatic. You're thinking, well, we know Saul. That's Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament, most significant Christian in the early church. Of course he was selected to be the associate. Oh, no. He'd not yet been introduced to public ministry at this time. He was still the recently converted religious terrorist. And so think of the courageous act that Barnabas performed in bringing this man into the leadership of the church. Holy Spirit guidance for leadership selection. What about Agabus? What did he do? He preached a message as a guest preacher and asked for a great offering. And that sounds like a really great idea, by the way, this morning. <clears throat> no, I'll leave off that part for me personally, but I would like to just note that when, Barnab when Agabus preached his message in, Acts chapter, or in verse 28, the result was in verse 29, the people rose up and gave a great offering. And then, of course, over in Acts chapter 13, the Spirit moved in the worship service, and what happened? The best leaders were sent away for mission work in other places. So we see the Holy Spirit working here, not to do something weird or unusual or to cause some kind of sideshow attraction that embarrasses or makes us uncomfortable. No, we see the Holy Spirit moving in this church to do things that seem so routine to us. The selection of leaders like pastors or deacons, the motivating of missionaries to send people all around the world, the giving of a great offering. May I just talk about the offering for just a moment as the application of this text on this issue of the Holy Spirit's work in your church? This morning, you received an offering. Ho, oh, hum. The music was beautiful. The ushers, orderly. Everyone participating it's routine it's not all that dramatic why do I say that was a moment when the Holy Spirit was powerfully at work in your church here's why the offering has become so routine for many of us including for me that I even write my offering check once a month and oftentimes mail it to my church because I travel and speak like this to places like yours our church even has a way to go online and give electronically so you don't even have to bother with the plate on a Sunday. We've turned the offering into a formal or even routine or even electronic means of participation. And none of those things are wrong, by the way. I'm simply saying that all of that speaks to the reality that it's become such a routine, normal part of what we do that we forget the supernatural moment of the offering. Here's what I mean. In this service this morning, there's, there's probably a younger couple. He's a sales rep or a manager uh, or an assistant manager of a department or a division of a company up and coming. She's perhaps a homemaker or maybe a school teacher or some other kind of person employed in the community. But they're a young couple that's just starting out and they've come this morning. Their income is adequate, but it's not extravagant. The offering was received and the husband looked down to his wife and said, Do you have a check? She fumbled in her purse and moved a couple of Pop-Tarts and a couple of other baby wipes and things out of the way and, and pulled out the check. And when the offering plate went by, she put it in. And you're saying, still not that supernatural. Well, it is when you consider that there are literally thousands of other young couples like that all over the greater Nashville area who sat at home this morning and spent every dime they made on themselves. But no, your couple was motivated to come to church, to bring an offering, and to give it generously and willingly to do the work of God in our world, sacrificing some of themselves. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has done some kind of profound work inside of them to liberate them from their selfishness and to make them generous people who want to see God's kingdom's work advance. Do you not see the supernatural in that moment? So many people in our world live so selfishly, and yet when Christians gather, we give so routinely that we forget the drama of the supernatural moment of the offering as a representation of the power of the Holy Spirit to change person after person after person after person over the years in this church family and give them the kind of generous giving spirit that God has motivated you to have. The Holy Spirit at work in the church in this context, in the offering. And I pray after this morning in a fresh way in your church in the same way. Number three, 
A church that makes an impact transforms people through teaching. Now, we like to think that the church in the Bible, that in the church in the Bible, everything happened quickly. Everything was dramatic and sudden in the Bible, but oh, not so. Notice verses 26 and 20, or 25 and 26. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to search for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. That's a 90-mile walk one way from Antioch to Tarsus and a 90-mile walk back. So this was no quick decision. And then notice what followed. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught large numbers. A church that makes an impact does not necessarily depend on the instantaneous or the spontaneous or the in the moment to transform its community or its world. A church that makes an impact transforms people through teaching, and sometimes that takes a while. That's why things like Sunday school and discipleship programs and seminars and conferences are so significant in our world because they are the expression of the church saying we transform people through teaching. We teach people how to live in family, how to live in marriage, how to manage money. We teach people how to understand doctrine, how to share their faith. We teach people practical ministry skills like how to teach children, how to teach preschoolers, how to lead a vacation Bible school. We teach to transform. That's what good churches do. And that's how churches make a prolonged impact in our world. A number of years ago, I was a church planter in Portland, Oregon. A man named Steve came to visit our church, early 30s, owned his own business, successful, not a Christian. After I met him, became acquainted, sat down with him, he asked, I asked him about his spiritual life, and he said, I'm very interested, but my first question is, on Sundays when you say open the Bible, you call out a place. How do you do that? He had never opened a Bible. Today, these 20 plus years later, he is an elder in his church and he and his wife are at the very center of the leadership base of a very significant congregation. How did that happen? I'll tell you how. <laughs> Painstaking teaching. <laughs> Taking an adult who'd never opened a Bible and teaching him how to find something in the Bible, how to read the Bible, how to understand the Bible, how to apply the Bible. And it was my privilege to watch over the first five to seven years of his development, the significant transformation of him, of him his family, his business, his lifestyle, his perspective on what really mattered, to see a man changed in front of my eyes. You see that happening here, don't you? You teach to transform. That's what churches that make an impact really do. That's why those of you who teach Sunday school, who teach Bible school, who teach discipleship courses, who lead seminars, who mentor one-on-one, -on -one, that's why you are so vital to the impact this church can make in this community. The most, most of an impact that's made is not in the instantaneous or the dramatic. It's in the ongoing uh, transformative work that's done through the teaching ministries of your church. Now, finally, a church that makes an impact gives itself away. And I've already mentioned both of these things, so I'll just summarize them and conclude. First of all, the church gave a generous offering for famine relief. This is quite an interesting offering if we had more time. Just briefly, the church at Jerusalem was a Jewish congregation. They'd had the gospel for almost a decade. When the Antioch church received the gospel, oh, those Gentiles... The Jews sent a leader, Barnabas, to investigate the situation to see if it was legitimate. Imagine that. A church has the gospel, holds on to it for almost a decade. When it finally leaks out to the Gentiles, they send an investigator to check out the movement. Do you think there might have been a bit of tension between these churches? And then the Jewish church asked the Gentile church for an offering. And the amazing thing is the Antioch church gave it. They gave a generous offering to their detractors. And then they gave their leaders away in Acts chapter 13 for missionary service. They sent Paul and Barnabas on these mission trips I previously mentioned, giving their people away to make an impact. This morning in your service, Pastor has already mentioned 
thanking God for the safe return of mission trips in Haiti and Montana, and there may have been other places as well. He's referenced the giving and the going that you've done, even this summer, to make a difference in our world. That's how churches make an impact. They rise above themselves, think of others, and always keep at the forefront their responsibility to get the gospel to people who've not yet heard it. So a church that makes an impact shares the gospel, experiences the spirit, teaches to transform, and gives itself away. Now here's the good news about First Baptist Nashville. All of these things I've mentioned are in some significant way a part of your church family. But here's the reality about your church and every other church as well. It requires disciplined focus to keep these aspects of church life a priority and to continually evaluate how you're doing in these areas and make the strategic changes necessary to be even more impactful in our world. And then it really comes down even more personally than that to you as an individual believer. I ask you this morning, are you sharing the gospel, experiencing the spirit, teaching or supporting a teaching ministry that transforms, willing to give yourself, your money, and your time a way to help others? It's not just about what the church will do. It's about what you will do this morning. And as we move to invitation and response, I want to challenge you to take this message personally and to make a response that's pointed and specific as to how you will be a more impactful Christian this week living out these realities I've described. Let's pray together, please. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of preaching here this morning. Thank you for this strong church that's made such an impact in its city and region. And thank you for these believers who've listened attentively and with ears to obey you this morning as you've spoken to them. Now I pray you'll move through this worship service time and in our response time, giving every person present the motivation to obey you in every way. And we receive it from you in Jesus' name. Amen. In these next few moments, I'm going to be standing down front. Some of the other ministers will join me. And if there's a commitment that the Lord has laid on your heart uh, to join this church or to follow Christ as Savior, maybe to rededicate or recommit your life to being uh, the person who can impact his community for Christ, I invite you to come. Let's stand as Mark leads us in an invitation hymn when you come. If you'd be seated, please.
church family, it is such a joy to be able to stand here with Grant and Sarah Wilkinson. The Wilkinsons have been members of First Baptist Church, very active in working with our student ministry, usually attend the fellowship on Broadway, and so we're happy to be able to uh, video stream the dedication into the chapel today as well. Um, they bring their daughter, McCleary, to be committed, uh, dedicated this morning. And in the process, we're happy to have big brothers. We've got Reese and we've got Hayden here. And it wasn't too long ago, young men, that uh, we had this very same kind of prayer time for you. And so uh, we are so thankful that the Lord has blessed you with a healthy, beautiful sister. So McCleary May is uh, being brought here today. And let me share with you a little bit about her name. McClary is a name from Sarah's grandmother, and uh, the name May comes from Grant's mother's name. And so we're so thankful to be able to celebrate that. Uh, the name McClary May means blessed. And uh, the life verse that Grant and Sarah have chosen for McClary comes from Psalm 25, verses 4 through 6. Make your ways known to me. Lord, teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. I wait for you all day long. Remember, Lord, your compassion and your faithful love, for they have existed from antiquity. Well, Grant and Sarah, as you stand here before your church family, I'm going to ask you if you will uh, reaffirm the promise that you have already made, a promise to raise your children in such a way that they can see Christ in you and will uh, wonder about the hope that lives within you. You'll practice family devotions. You'll bring your children to, to worship. You'll teach them the faith, and they'll see Christ in you. And if this is your commitment, will you say we will? And church family, I'll ask you, Will you continue to be the church that makes an impact in individual lives just like this family's as the Lord calls you to be Sunday school teachers and to work in children's choir and to teach missions and to model the faith in the hallways, to be friendly people who welcome children, and to be the kind of church members who will slide over when a, a visitor comes to church and give them your seat? If you will promise to do those kinds of things, will you share that by saying, we will? Well, I'm going to see if I can take McCleary for a little walk here in this congregation. And she likes to sit forward so she can see where she's going. Oh, what a precious little girl. Well, McCleary, as we start walking today right through this church, I'm going to pause here where your family is gathered. And uh, McCleary, they're so excited to welcome you into this family. And uh, they're, so, they're so thrilled about uh, having a little girl to, to, to be cousins to these other little girls. And uh, I'm sure that as they celebrate your name and what it means in the family, that, that they're just so excited about you being here. And McCleary May, as we continue into this part of your family, this is your church family. And these are wonderful people. And they've made a commitment today to love you and to pray for you and to teach you and to, to be your friends and to be the kind of church family where you can see faith lived. And one day you're going to catch it. There'll be times when... We have children's activities here on these steps, and you may be in this worship service, or you may be in vacation Bible school or some other environment where, where you'll have the opportunity to come down here with other friends. You'll, you'll probably get the chance to sing and to do some other things here in this church to, to, to just kind of let us check in with you and, and to see how faith is growing in your life. And McCleary, these brothers of yours... They're going to help you in this journey of faith as well. They're going to love on you, and they're going, to, they're going to just be so excited to see their little sister growing in the Lord. And McCleary, you're going to go over to the Fellowship on Broadway as you get older, and, and you're going to sing with those people who love you and are praying for you even this morning. And we just want to say welcome. We're so glad to have you here. Church family, let's pray together. 
Dear God, what a joy and what a privilege it is uh, to see you at work in the lives of your children. Thank you for Grant and Sarah. Thank you for the commitment to marriage and the commitment to Christ that they exhibit in their family and in their membership here at this church. Thank you for Reese and Hayden and for the healthy growth that we see in their life. And Father, I pray for them that they'll be godly big brothers to McCleary. God bless McCleary May. I pray that she will be wise and strong and pure. In Jesus' name. All right, well, we have, um, we have some folks to introduce today. I'm going to invite Jean and Sandra Adams to stand with me first. And Mark is their son. Mark, if you'll come and bring Tanner with you. And he's got his name tag. Cody, there we go. I thought it was Cody, but I wanted to say it right. Good. Uh, these are the Adams, and they come this morning to make First Baptist their home. Uh, Jean and Sandra... Uh, have served God's church as pastor and have served in many different places and they've recently come into uh, the Nashville community and uh, Mark comes and brings his boys this morning who are members of the Sunday school. Uh, the three uh, would like to make First Baptist their home today and church family, I know you'd like to welcome them and you want to promise to pray with them and encourage them any way that uh, you can. I'd like to just ask you to say amen. God bless you, and I hope that you'll come by and greet this family personally. Uh, now, Cody uh, and, and Tanner, this is, this, is, uh, this is Adam who comes up here to stand with you as, as your friend, and we're so thankful. Patrick, we're so thankful for you to, to stand up here, and we've got some other friends, uh, Red and Joan, coming down just to stand beside you to welcome you to First Baptist today as well. Tom, we're so glad to have you back. You've been missioning in Canada and in Montana and a few other places, and uh, it's a joy to have you back home, and uh, you look refreshed and ready to hit it. Absolutely. We're hitting it. It's going to be fast and good week. We have a lot with the SIN conference and then the Congressional Medal of Honor recipients this week. It's going to be a wonderful week. And, Pastor, just on behalf of your, our church and the Canadian Baptist Seminary, let me say a word of thanks to our church for 20 years of partnership recognized this past week with our team and I was privileged to be able to be with the seminary there for a few days. Great. Thank you. Great. Well, welcome back. And Mark Edwards, it's always a joy to have you sharing the, the platform with us here. Thank you for leading in Joe's absence. Dr. Orge, thank you again for worshiping, leading us today and preaching for us in such a great way. And uh, thank you for your friendship. Uh, I didn't remind you, I'm a graduate of Golden Gate. It's the only seminary. Just want to make sure we, we kind of get that out there. And uh, there we go. Well, you know. <laughs> All right. Well, let's stand, and Mark's going to dismiss us in song. I look forward to seeing you in the foyer.